Hi guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Today we have the legendary Mr. Ivan Balabanov joining us. So Ivan is a two-time world champion. He's a 14-time national champion. If this man is competing, he is winning and I do not want to compete alongside him. So without further ado, we're gonna invite Ivan in. And today we're gonna talk about the power of play, possession games, chase and catch, and some uh, tips for all you first-time IGP people. So let's get Mr. Hey. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Whew, it always takes me a little moment to figure it out how, how to do this, but here we are. Here we are, worth the wait. How's it going? Uh, oh, wow. That's a, that's a crazy question right now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, things are, things been really good. Um, I just got back from a competition that was really nerve wracking and tomorrow, not tomorrow, but Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I have, um, the students from my class are coming for graduation and certification this weekend. So they're going to just arrive from all over the place. And we have three days of, uh, yeah, it's kind of fun times, but it's also busy, busy times that, um, you know, everybody's been studying and it's a uh, final, final days of, of, you know, before they get certified, hopefully everything goes well. So I'm just doing a lot of reviewing the testing and changing some things, making it more interesting. Yeah. Not necessarily more difficult, but yeah, I'm kind of in a teacher's mode right now. Awesome. So, how you been? All good. Uh, happy that it's summer and the pandemic is coming to a close and normal, normal living. So yeah, all good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I want to, so I, the recent photo that you shared, you with a bunch of trophies and a Malinois, classic Ivan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what was that? <laughs> Yeah, so that was, that was really the, um, that was that competition. It was, um, I think it was like a couple of weeks ago and we placed second, uh, which I'm super, super happy. Sometimes people will be like, well, what happened? Why second? It's like, a, you know, but that, that would be typical for people that don't understand the, how competition go. It's not always so easy. But it was a tough, uh, very, very, um, I had last year two big competitions and we couldn't pass tracking for whatever reason. It was like this big mystery of, you know, like in training, everything's going to be just perfect. He lost tracking and then at two national championships, he just was like really weirded out about it. So that was in my head. And I went like four weeks ahead of time to, um, where was it in, in Pennsylvania, just to do tracking and kind of play like the whole, like the whole trial scenario to where somebody else will lay the tracks and I will have a few people with me, one pretending to be a judge and, and all this just to try to recreate it as much as possible. And it was crazy because I still didn't know what's going to happen. And so, yeah, I focused all of my time in tracking because in my head, nothing else really was that important. Like I, I just needed to know if that's where I stay with this. Because as I said, like absolute mystery of, couldn't really figure it out what's going on in his head and why because anytime we will be in training he just makes like beautiful tracks completely enjoying them and then these two times he would go to the beginning of the track and be like I can't do it I'm like what the hell just mind-boggling um, but yeah we got a excellent scoring tracking which was amazing and i feel really good about it but it's still you know it's still in my head i still don't know we have a big competition 
this the one that I was at that was the all breed competition and now we have the only Belgian Shepherd competitions coming and it's gonna be back in that same area and it's in October. And I'm trying to think that we you know, whatever that little thing in his head was, we kind of passed that, but um who knows? And um yeah. It's interesting. Competitions are always, you know, when you when you are not in the competition, you always look into scores and maybe watch the life um, um, of the day, how how things are going. But um, there is so much going on to prepare and to make sure that you have this five or ten minutes on the field that everything has to just come the way you want it to come and it's not easy and dogs get injured um so i had a a week right before the competition i'm playing ball of course which we're going to talk about (laughs) but so we are at the tracking fields and we're playing and he it's raining whatever he just kind of gets twisted a little bit so his shoulder he starts limping. So I had to give him a break. Um, like the whole week before the trial, I couldn't do obedience or protection. I could, but then was like the risk of, okay, I can try to get more ready, but then he's going to be limping and maybe I cannot even compete all together. So I, I know where my training is there. So I was like, you know, he can, he can rest. We, all I need is a nice score in tracking. And yeah, we paid a little price for that. It was super hot, it was like 92 degrees or something when we were on the field and he, um, I was just kind of trying to go through the whole routine. Of course, typically in training, I have a certain things that I would do right before like the last three days, like it's this really important kind of preparation. And once that's skipped, you got to go to plan B and plan C, which that's just the beauty of competition. That's kind of why we do it, I guess, because there is, it never goes exactly how you want it to be planned, no matter how well you plan it. Um, so yeah, he, he ended up going over the jump and on the way back, he touched it pretty hard and I want to think partially was me throwing that dumbbell a little bit too short, but also him not having that um, spring that he normally does because of the shoulder. So that was costly. And then in protection, he, you know, like in IGP, when they bark in the blind, then you have to call him, but the judge gives you a sign, you have to call him and they come into a heel position. So he was so happy that he's finally doing protection because of that little bit of a break. And I call him to come in a basic position and he comes on the other side of me in a perfect basic position, but completely unaware that something is wrong. And that's, I mean, it's a funny thing now when you look back, but it's another kind of costly mistake. So. Yeah, competitions. It's it's so now we have a lot to do for the next one. Um, but yeah, that's kind of behind now. Now I'm really just trying to focus on on the school and the, the people that's gonna come and going over all the tests and stuff like that. Um, but we will be talking about play. I'm guessing. Yes. Yes. So a a transition into the power of play and um, the importance of play when it comes to establishing a good relationship and building a bond with your dog. Yeah. Um, So play is a a very, uh, I can really talk a lot about it and I'll, I'm just going to kind of start talking and see where we go with that and probably bounce back and forth in different areas. Um, play is a, like, like it's, it used to be even like 10, 15 years ago, 
that even scientists didn't pay attention, didn't consider play as important as it actually is to 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 humans and and dogs, as I'm gonna explain in a little bit. Um, it's always used to be to where play is this thing that we do in our spare time. It, it was on a anything of big importance like this. Okay, we have nothing to do. Let's have some fun. Let's do some play. Um, but there is a a lot of a lot of studies, a lot of stuff that went on, and now we know that. All mammals, especially, like anything from a little rodent to a dog and a horse and humans, of course, we are actually biologically programmed to play. Like we don't, we have a need to do that. It's not like something that we need to, uh, uh, somebody needs to teach us. Like we can learn how to play games or how to do whatever activities, but the desire and uh, to interact through place, it's, you know, we're, it's in our DNA, if you want to put it that way. And all mammals, like uh, I would invite any anybody after uh, we are done, for, for the people that are following and watching right now, um, go on YouTube and, and you can look at dogs trying to invite a statue to play with a stick or a cow fetching a ball or a dolphin in an open ocean doing for the first time just some uh, rugby player somewhere in Australia, I think it was. And, and I don't know, they, maybe they were just kind of a little drunk or whatever, but one decided that he's going to throw the ball for the dolphin and the dolphin went and brought it back and then he did it again. And then eventually they just ended up playing a fetch game with a dolphin just out of nowhere. And um, so this, this kind of shows that, um, you know, play, play is something much more important than, than what we think. Um, when you deprive, like, like kids specifically, if you deprive a kid from touch, that's going to be a really horrible for the development. I mean, that's going to be a, a, probably the worst thing to do. But maybe the second worst thing, if not as equally horrible, would be to uh, um, not allow to play. And um, there, there was, um, that wasn't even a study. That's what happened in back in East European countries and specifically Romania when they were under the communism, like in the late 80s and early 90s, um, once the, the regime, you know, the, got removed and they went to the orphanages and see kids that basically they were, you know, anything from infants to maybe seven, eight, ten years old, cramped. And um, this, by the way, it's also on YouTube, you, you know. I, I would encourage everybody that's interested in play to, to take a look at the what a person would look like if he doesn't have such interaction. Um, but um, so it, it's a, you know, they just don't develop right. Like it's so important for development because it's a really interesting interaction um, when you play and the thing with, with uh, another thing with play is that for whatever reasons, humans, we are, we have this unreal gift to come up with infinite numbers of games. Like we can just, whatever, how, how many times I can toss this word and how many times you can and, and so on. And just like, we can just keep coming up so easy we don't even need to just think so hard we can come up with games non-stop for from now to infinity that's how we deeply programmed play is in our minds um and what is cool 
especially about humans compared to other mammals is that we don't like like let's say most of the mammals that play as youngsters as they grow up as they start maturing they their interest starts to shift in different areas and even if they play to some level it's not as when they were young and there is some reasons for that that we will kind of touch on that too but what is interesting where i'm going with this is that dogs and humans we can play from from the moment we can are, are actually able to play until we are gone until we die we 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 love play and that's something you know among many other things that really connects and we really look at each other dog and human of like you like the same things i do and and it's not like we grow up we can you know you can play with a 14 year old dog you just got to be careful because who knows what they're gonna break walking <laughs> towards the ball right um so it's a you know so like um so many misconceptions about play and one big one even even in some of the like the marine world trainers like the orcas dolphins sea lion even there some uh, um okay let me let me back up here it, it, as i said it's a biologically programmed which means it's basically a primary reinforcer play is not something that uh, you know you need to reward with food the play itself is biologically rewarding to you and it's important to your development um and i don't know some some there is like actually people sell like dog dog companies they will sell um little tuck toys or balls where you can open it and you can put some treats inside to encourage the dog to play and basically get it rewarded with food um and that's a it's pretty ridiculous idea cuz it just completely diminished the the value and the importance and and eventually later on in training you also uh when you're when you're trying to maybe withhold rewards or manipulate rewards if you if you don't understand what is a condition what is primary reinforcer uh you're going down a rabbit hole and and you know of course things will work to some level but will not work at the the optimal um so yeah that that kind of comes from surprisingly the the marine mammal trainers they they were very and still i mean to as much as they can still do training they would still reinforce the dolphin to go and do some trick with the ball and come back and get a fish um i'm not a dolphin trainer but um i know that you can you don't have to do that or at, or at least you need to understand that play doesn't need to be uh you know it is a primary reinforcer is what i'm saying um so when you like like when i'm talking about development and and all the i mean endless benefits really but i'll i'll just name few um before that i guess i i should say that i divide like i've spent like all all of my training being with uh, pet dogs with shelter dogs like like a, a sport dogs a, everything goes around play of course there is always room for other things um sometimes people will say well do you ever use food as yes i do but it's definitely probably 10% of the time uh if if 
I, I need to, but uh, the, the main the main reward and the main activity really is uh, play for me. Play, so there is a, like I divide before I go into, you know, my games of chase and catch and possession games, I have to back up and, and there is games and then there is activities. So you can have a, you can kind of bounce a ball or pull on a rope, but there is no real purpose. And that's why I kind of call it activity. So like if you imagine uh, what kind of, let's say basketball, hockey, whatever, but you take the, you take the goal or you take the, the hoop out of the game. And then unless they decide to come up with a different objective, how to compete or how to compare each other's skill and how to improve, then it stays on a level of some sort of activity that it's still pleasant, of course, but it kind of, you can just kind of bounce the ball and fade away and okay, I'm done. And, and, and that's that. To where games, they have objectives. And anytime you have an objective, you strive to accomplish the objective. So there is a goal. And that makes you improve. And when you accomplish a goal, what else happens? Your confidence boosts. So um, let's say a lot of times I will have, you know, when I give presentations or at the school, we will be talking about, well, what about a shy dog? What about the aggressive dog? And it's very important for a shy dog to, you know, it's one of the really easy ways to build confidence because if the dog learns how to be successful and how to be good at something and understand that they are, that's an instant boost of confidence. And it's far more easy for the dog to understand than just giving food and telling him that he's a good boy. He's taking the food, but it it really doesn't do much to grow and, and become somebody, as I like to say. Um, so having these games, having objectives, makes a very interesting uh, um, interaction between the dog and the trainer. And of course, like... Um, you know, you can play with two balls, you can play with, you can make games super easy to where the objective is. Um, there is not, how should I say this? There is not too much cooperation needed. It's like you get that ball, well, I have this one, so you don't, you speed this one and you want this one. And we can go on like this without really having to agree on anything unless we make a, a specific point about it. But if we have one ball or one stick or whatever, one thing for me and the dog to interact through play, that means that we need to find some way to cooperate. Because if we don't cooperate, then the game goes down the drain, right? And that's uh, one of the really, really cool things about games. Um, trainers often will get discouraged, frustrated, even, even upset at themselves or the dog because the games that they want to play don't come naturally and they're spending time and it doesn't seem to be happening and they ultimately they give up and either butcher the game or completely abandon and go into a different style of training. But the beauty of play is not even the play itself as an end result, but the fact that finding a way, you and I, to agree of what the rules are, what the objective is, and what the consequences are for breaking these rules. 
So these three things, this is like huge and it takes time. But when you have a dog that understands how to cooperate with you, when you've made the dog feel comfortable trusting you, you made the dog uh, um, understand that there's going to be some guidance and that there's going to be some objective. This is how we play that game. And of course, in order for any game to get really good at it, there is rules. Because, okay, if whatever game anybody can think of, there is rules. Right after the objective being, okay, you're going to put the basket or you're going to, whatever you're going to do to win the game, that's going to be your objective. And immediately, we have to have rules. But you cannot do it by running or kicking or pushing or so on. And rules, of course, as we know, are meant to be broken, especially when you really want to win a game. So then there is consequences for breaking the rules. And that lead to compliance and that lead to agreement and that lead to some form of discipline. And when I say discipline, uh, I don't want people to start going way too deep in that. But there will be, in any game, you have an objective, you have rules, and you have consequences, penalties for breaking the rules. When all these three things can come together and we still are willing to interact, this is, in my world, far more important than having that whatever 10 month 10 week old puppy doing the sit down stand and a spin to the left spin to the right chasing food not even understanding what it's doing because it looks like it's doing something it's just chasing food um so it can be in such an early age that we can accomplish some major major um things of importance about how we interact and and um, yeah, let me have a sip. <laughs> <laughs> we had someone ask, have you seen a dog that just wasn't able to play? And I'm gonna piggy, piggyback off that. Say if um, a dog in the early stages wasn't exposed to play, um, how, how do you go about teasing the play out of them? Right, so um, Yeah, this is, these are the beautiful things about play. Now, there are times when the dog is either so traumatized or is so old or is from a certain breed that was bred over and over and over to where they basically really became just, just there is some... Uh, Like if you, if you don't want to play, you really don't have uh, like any, any goals in, in your life because play is, in a way, it's competition and it's, it's it, like everything comes from there. But having said that, there, there is times where it's not possible, but they're very rare. Um, as I said, it takes patience. You need to reevaluate everything that you're doing you also need to have to make sure that you are enjoying. It's not like, hey, here is the ball or here is the talk. You bite it. That's not inviting. And especially for a dog that doesn't have, doesn't see it as fun activity, you being so standoffish is not going to make him want to play the cool thing about play is that you read you you get feedback and forth of your emotions and and you desire to interact and even if the dog doesn't join immediately if you continue for a session two five ten and just bring the dog but play by yourself just you know act like things are fine and you're having fun 
And as I said, I've reevaluate what you're doing else. Um, like for example, you if you come back from work and you say, well, now it's six o'clock and it's time for us to train because that's what we do. But if you're trying to accomplish something, you, you need to start not when you want to start. You need to look at the dog and you need to decide when the dog wants to do something. And that may take a while. But when the dog says, okay, I, I kind of feel like I have a little spunk. Well, what should I do? And you say, well, I have an idea. Let's go and do that. And that's kind of how it starts. Um, as I said earlier, super important is that um, dogs that seem like they don't want to play, the trainer, instead of starting to feel frustrated, the moment you feel frustrated, dogs are super keen. And they're like, okay, he, he doesn't want to play. He's actually borderline angry at me for some reason. But it's for, for whatever reason, it's also bouncing a ball in front of me. That's not going to make it happen, right? So that's what I'm saying. You've got to really put like a, some big Hollywood production and pretend that you're having the best time of your life in front of them. And then put them away. And then even when you put them away, don't, don't try to be very sincere and very affectionate. Um, and take time, observe. Pick the right time. Pick the time when the dog really wants to do something. Sometimes we also get so fixated on what we want to play with. And then we would buy this toy because this other trainer uses it and it's so effective. And then that doesn't work. And then we go to the next toy. And it's really not about, I mean, I don't want to bankrupt uh, dog companies, but it, it's really not about uh, what kind of toy it is. Um, a few years back, I was in, I was giving some some presentation, and and uh, these people from uh, um, what was the name Pennsylvania, the working dog, uh, they have their breeding program. They do all sorts of detection and stuff. Pretty pretty knowledgeable um, uh, stuff going on there. But uh, somebody came with a Dutch Shepherd bred there, eight, ten months old, and they were like, well, he just does not want to play. And he comes and he brings, I'm like, okay, let, let's see what, what's going on. So he comes and he brings a little bag with all sorts of cute toys. I mean, everything is there. And he tries and the dog is really like pretending that he does not exist. Like he's not running away or anything, but he's like, there's no way I'm doing anything with you with these things that you're throwing at my face. And so we stopped for a moment. I, I had to kind of gather some history, get some questions answered that I have. So the dog is sitting down by us and we are talking and he's explaining how, you know, he, he did the right things and the dog never really opened up to play. But I asked him, well, what about like, is he just by nature? I mean, have you ever seen him like play bow and, you know, it's a 10 month old dog. Like when you talk about play, you're talking about interaction. And if he cannot play bow, if you, for 10 months, you have never seen him play bow and invite you to do something or get excited when it sees another dog, then we have something pathological and then something, uh, you know, not quite right. And he's like, yeah, no, he, he, he would play with some of the dogs. And I see him, I mean, he's, you know, when the moment we stop interacting with him and trying to push him into let's play, he kind of curious looking around and, and next thing he is chewing on a stick. I mean, like, it's not even like a, like a, maybe something a little bigger than a straw, but he kind of has it in his paws and he's like chewing on it. So. 
we know that that's not for food, right? It's a stick. But he's entertaining himself. Being bored, he's not like, at least not making lick sores on his face. He decided to chew on a stick. Mm -hmm. So I sat down with him. I pet him a little. And he's chewing on a stick. And then he kind of laid down. He liked that I'm petting him. He dropped the stick. So I got the stick and I tossed it like maybe five feet, maybe less than five feet. And then he kind of looked at me. And he went and he got his stick back. And to make it short, we ended up playing with a stick. And the the point of the story, the obvious point is that, you know, play doesn't have to happen in the way you want it right away. At the time that you want it, like there is a lot that you need to understand and give in. It's very different than when we train by using aversive, when we train by using escape avoidance responses. Then it's like, no, you're going to do because I said so and this is the consequences. But to make a dog play, you really need to make the dog feel comfortable with you, trust in you. All other needs have to be met. And then little by little play happens. But when you can play with a dog, you know that you're in a different place in your relationship with a dog from that point on. Interesting enough, the, the, the guy I can think of, well, I don't even need to say the name, but I cannot even think of it. He was like, try with the, try, try with this toy. It looks like a stick. You know, he has this, uh, you know, the little rubber bone things that it's not a, it's actually really a stick, but it's a rubber stick that pets Marcel. Like, oh, I have this one. I'm like, why? <laughs> like, well, what's the urgency right now? We barely convince him that it's okay that I can interact with him. There is nothing magical about a certain toy. And, and in fact, the whole point of a, like one, one of the really cool things about games is that you understand and appreciate the interaction and not really, you don't get obsessed about the object. Like think of a football game, basketball game, whatever, you know, the, the referee eventually ends the game they don't just jump at a ball and have a big melee who's going to take the ball home because it's not about it. And anytime you see this, it, uh, when the sessions are ending, you know that there is things that you still need to work on because the dog is not quite understanding that the toy is just the, the tool, the, the object that we end up interacting with. It's not something that really has this lifelong, um, um, I need to possess it and it's mine. Because if you do that, you end the game. There is no more game. It's the same thing when you watch two dogs and the one is younger and the other one is bigger and stronger. They know how to come down on the level on the young one to play and they will even make them win from time to time because if they just grab the toy or drop the toy and snap at him the other one's not going to want to play anymore so and this is the cool thing about when we talk cooperation um so uh, endless really endless endless benefits including Wait, question did the owner yeah. eventually learn that he must unlock mm. the play from within how did that go so he he came, he came the second day. We kind of ended there. He came the second on the second day. I think it was like a three day seminar. He came and um, he was so excited. He's like I I tried in the hotel room, but he didn't want to play. But I'm curious to see if he's gonna do now. And I'm like, okay. I mean, nothing wrong that he tried because. Obviously, he's been trying for 10 months. If he tries one more time, it's not going to break anything. If the dog's <laughs> going to play with me, he's still going to play with me. Um, 
but he was so adamant to to try with a toy. I'm like, okay, I mean, go ahead, nothing wrong. You you can try. And the dog immediately shifted, and like just the change of demeanor, just amazing. Um, refused. And then I called him. He came to me, and I grabbed something. I don't know, like a just a bigger. It wasn't a stick. It was actually a. Um, oh, see now my English. What is called the the peel of the tree, the you know. A stump? Like core. A, st- a pe- birch, birch? I don't know. It's just like a part stump. of the tree, maybe, yeah. And I mean, just something completely like you wouldn't think you would play with that, but that's all we had. Bark. And so I started playing, and he decided that he's going to play. And the play, of course, it wasn't like I throw far away and you bring it back and we do this over and over again. That was not the play. But I know we could get them. It's not that hard. Ah, bark. That's the... Bark. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, and, and it was more of, you know, he's chewing. I try to steal it. Then he moves away. Then I take it. Then I throw it. Then you know, a little bit of stalking, a little, just very gentle, just interacting and paying attention to each other. And so when I say paying attention, ultimately, you know, I mean, I advised him that it's, you know, pretty much what I'm telling you right now, you you need to pick up the right times, you need to become sincere, you cannot force it, play is not something that you force that's the, the the art about it because you have to come to an agreement what you have to force is the rules and understand consequences without destroying the cooperation of the interaction so it's, it's a very interesting thing but as i said we are biologically programmed we are born to be capable to do that if we do the right things towards each other mm-hmm. and so yeah, I I never really heard back and me with my life, it's this kind of common, I, I would go somewhere, I would help and unless somebody comes back and he has uh, more questions or or I see them somewhere, I, he just kind of goes away. So I, I'm not sure what happened, um, but as far as I'm concerned, I know that the dog was able to play. He, he wasn't like uh, nothing mental, nothing pathological. He just did not have the, like the approach, whatever they were doing was the dog just didn't trust and he had a big dislike towards. And, and this is again, like it's, it's a, in some way, the people that have dogs that play you know, the kind of dogs that I'm talking about that, like if we are sitting right now here, they will grab the ball and they'll be just here and staring at you and just nudging it to you and you eventually will toss it, right? They will teach somebody that doesn't know what to do. They'll teach them how to play fetch with them. But then you have the other ones that they need that help and they, uh, um, it's hard for them and this is where the, the really art comes to where when you teach a dog to play, it's easy if you, if the dog is stressed in your training and he doesn't want to take your food and you're like, oh, I'm going to change the treats and well, he's not going to eat, he's going to nothing in life, it's three kind of things, which I'm very much against. Hopefully we don't need to talk about that. Uh, but, um, you know, you can make a dog take treats from you. You can force him. That's, you know, he has to eventually eat, right? Same thing if we are using escape avoidance, using some form of aversive being, whatever, with the dish, with electric, whatever it is, and we ask him to sit or come, we will make him come. He will have no choice. With play, it's a different way of interaction. But if you can do that with a dog, the dog appreciates you on a different level. It's a very, very 
it, it really is uh, uh, on, on a very different level. Um, another benefits of games, like um, I will give you another story that just happened like literally three days ago. But uh, the uh, so okay, oh, so the the um, I, I sold a dog to to somebody, and she's about fourteen months old, and they're doing protection sports, and the person went to few schools. I mean, he's very knowledgeable, uh, um, you know, but. He, he wanted me to take a look and evaluate the dog. And I'm like, okay, well, let's do what, what exactly, what are, you, are there any concerns or what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I'm thinking to switch from ring sports to IGP or I don't know. I'm like, well, why do you want to do that? So we went back and forth for a little bit. Eventually, um, I thought that I'm going to be doing some protection and test the dog and see what, what the dog is about. But he decided that I should look at how they interact and how they play. And of course, that's what we did, because I mean, obviously, that's what you need to do. So they come here in this, this is where I am right now. That's kind of my training room. And she walks in. And she's full of life. I mean, just full of herself, just bouncing like a cricket back and forth. Just like, I'm like, okay, that's going to look really cool. And he gets one toy out. She kind of latches on the toy for a second, but then she lets go. Then another toy comes out. Then I start to see that it's what I call activity, how I was talking earlier. Like there is just no, like it's just everything. It's just energy that is constantly spilling all over the place. But there is no, no objective. There is no game. So nothing really goes anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I had to ask them how, of course, the part, part of the solutions not just out of curiosity, but part of the solution is like what, what has been done in the past. Why do you think that's happening? Was it like this from the get-go or what did the more knowledgeable trainer advise you and so on? So the, the, in a nutshell, yes, it was, she was always like this from a puppy, always interested in something else. Um, then the, some of the really influential big names in the dog community would they, they would in advice to um trying to find what the dog wants to do and kind of build from there what is the dog favorite toy or what is the dog favorite style of interaction so they can build on that and eventually guide it somewhere which is in in a lot of cases this could be a good solution um, and what I ended up doing is just really let, let her, let her show me what she wanted to do because I tried to give her the one toy. She beat it. Then she beat the handle. Then she let go of it, dropped it on the ground, started to look at what else there is. And of course I have like seven bike suits and four racks of bike sleeves and I don't know. I mean, it's just a dog training room. So there is a lot of stuff that she's interested in. So I'm like, just let her, let her free. And now she has all the choices, whatever she wanted to do, but I want to see what she wants to do, right? So she goes, she grabs something. I'm like, okay, let's play with that. She comes, she grabs it. And almost instantly, so okay, I'm done with that. And then starts doing something else and something else. Um, and, you know, every once in a while, dog trainers, for whatever reason, love to talk about dopamine, but it's quite confusing and I don't want to really get into a big, what happens in your brain and the chemicals, how they work lecture here, but, uh, 
she was a very prime example of, of uh, what dopamine really is, like a, a dopamine junkie. Because you know, dopamine mm. has a very good things. I mean, without it, we, we will not survive. You, we obviously need it. But it's, uh, it's not like the, the reward chemical that you search pleasure or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's basically uh, you, you are always chasing something in the future. You're never happy here and now. It's like, let's say I, I go and I win some championship and maybe an hour later, I'm like, okay, what, what now? Um, and as I said, there is the benefits, but there is a lot, a lot of bad stuff about it because you, you just, you cannot stay focused. You cannot pay attention. And this is what I really wanted to mention. This is why I ended up talking about that though, because what games teach you, even from a little puppy, which is super important when you have a, a, a working dog, when you're going to interact like in training is that it reinforces or it teaches and improves the dog to be able to pay attention, to stay focused on the same task for a very long time. And some can do it very easy and some struggle with it. But it's not even only mental. There is a physical endurance and mental endurance. And we know that the moment you reach physical fatigue, of course, your brain starts to be more busy how to manage that, how to budget that deficit of, of okay, your fatigue versus focusing on the game. So the moment you physically cannot, that's why you, you're like not interested anymore to play. So mental and physical endurance are super important. And this is one of the best ways to accomplish it is through playing, not not a treadmill, not bike running. Um, because treadmill and bike running don't focus on uh, the mental endurance, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there, there's like really um, so, so, so many benefits of it. Um, another ones are, of course, even, you know, I mean, depending who you talk to, even now I still hear Oh, you can should never ever if you're some shelter trainers or or some pet trainers like play tug with your dog. He should never be biting things and whatever. Um, but that's how you establish. That's like the the smartest and the smoothest way to establish rank, to establish some authority is through play. It's because when the rules are broken, then there is consequence. Then, then you have to learn how to accept the penalty and how to comply to the rules. And in order for me to be able to reinforce all that, but still maintain the cooperation and the healthy interaction, that means that I'm going to create authority that you're going to have to follow, but we're still best of friends. Mm -hmm. And that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, and, when, you, and so, when you're training for the competitions on a daily basis, basis um how do you know when to like cap a session or how do you keep your own like mental endurance to make sure that you know you're keeping the dog accountable or uh you're not overexerting the dog and right. you know, the dog gets sloppy let's say yeah so um i mean there's different depending on the dog you you have to strategize and normally they're a little bit different variations, um, but we know we know when you when we work when fatigue comes in. And one of the good analogies that normally I talk about is when you have um, um, like let's say let's say you go to the gym and you're gonna work out and you want to kind of get healthy, stronger, whatever your goal is. And you hire a trainer because if you don't hire a trainer, you never are able to push yourself in that way and, and, and so on. Um, 
And what a, a fitness trainer normally will do is they will kind of tell you, okay, do seven of this or five or whatever, and kind of watch you and pretty much don't care until they see that you're reaching that moment of fatigue. And then it's like, okay, now we start to train. Now you're going to make three more reps or five more reps of whatever that is. But this is when now the muscle and the body and the brain, everything needs to get this urgency and produce and, and get fit and, and improve. And so the same concept in a way I implement when I train. Mm -hmm. I, I would train, I would watch. I would, the moment I start to see being physical, being mental fatigue, I, I also kind of give breaks, like uh, just mental breaks within the session. I don't, I'm not that big on short training sessions. I, I like to have a long session, but there are breaks to where we can actually really just have a sip of water or take 20 seconds to catch breath and then we hear it again. Um, but towards that moment when I know that no break can recover anymore, then I would stop asking anything like like the, the actual work's going to stop. Because I know now if I ask him to heal, he will do it, but it's not going to be with that precision, with that intensity, with that joy. And I don't want to give him the idea that I will be okay with him not giving me exactly what I need, right? Or even if I say, well, you're not giving me, I'm going to force it. When you force it, it's not going to look right. But so that's kind of the point of the training session when I would say, okay, I'm not going to ask you any more behaviors, but we're going to go into a little more play. And of course, for people that are going to watch that, I'm not suggesting that you overwork dogs because especially dogs that are, you know, working breeds, like you can literally overheat and kill them by throwing ball because they would not know how to stop. So, you know, you have to be very reasonable, but you certainly can work on building uh, uh, that mental and physical endurance, which is super important. Without that, um, you know, you, you're staying in this plateau, just like, as again, as I say, if you're going to the gym and every time you go, you do whatever it is five times. You, you never really stimulate that body to improve, right? So that, that's another big uh, thing that I would do when I play. We have a, a bunch of questions about, um, well, a, a bunch of people that are just getting into IGP. Um, do you have any, uh, any tips for, uh, for people starting? Um, yeah, like the really the, the best tip that I can give anyone is focus on play before anything else. Um, it's almost counterintuitive, especially when you see all this. It's just such a norm to take some food and do all these things and make the puppy follow food or the old dog. Um, you can do that at any point in time. And then, you know, you can take a 14 year old dog and he will do just as a eight week old puppy. But for the development on a young puppy, play, cooperation rules, consequences, attention span, physical, mental endurance, all those things are, are far more important to me. So, um, yeah, I have like my the dog, well, dog, a puppy that I have right now. Um, he's, what is he, maybe eight months old. It's going to sound funny. He doesn't know how to down on command yet. <laughs> he knows what he knows out because out is important and the way we learn to out is super important. So we don't have any animosity against each other, uh, but we can play forever. 
we want to play forever, no matter what time of the day or night it is. And I have to stop him because he will not stop. Then I taught him healing probably in a week that looks incredible right now. Like you can just go and 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 go. And there is no like I'm not holding toy or not making spin. There is nothing. It's just I have built that enough of motivation and sense of cooperation and a feeling of what the objective is that just pushes through. It's just a matter of how to show it. And so he knows out. He has a beautiful healing. I just started to teach him sit like a few days ago. And but everything is going to start to come extremely fast. And the reason it's going to come extremely fast is again, I have cooperation. And I, he has motivation. He's kind of, he's kind of like a like a druggie. He's injected. He he's he's done. He's mine. Like he's like, please let's play. All it takes now is to say, well, we're going to play if. You do that little thing. And he's like, of course. And so, yeah, um, don't underestimate play. That, that's like my biggest advice um, for anybody. And it doesn't need to be IGP, anything that you do with dogs. Even if you do shelters, if you do service, whatever it is, play by far is the, the most important thing in my, in my world. No question. What is your favorite thing to teach? Oh, so, I mean, I'm very competitive and I'm very interested in, in, I always kind of experiment. I always, you know, it's kind of having that beginner's mind. You always, and it's not even like, I like the little challenges. It's not a specific, the things that I know, how to teach really well there you know the, I'm going through the motions and it's not to say that I don't enjoy it but there is yeah we're gonna heal and you're gonna have beautiful attention and you're gonna be wagging your tail and you're gonna come really far like these are the things that when you have the right dog and the right selection and you know how to make it it's just a matter of time but what is really interesting to me is the little challenges that come along the way. That's what keeps me motivated to even think of, well, that's not quite well working with you, does it? Let's think what else can we do and come to some agreement and then see, well, can it last? Is it going to? So it's, uh, it's actually the, it can be in any area of dog training. But it's these little challenges. That's what uh, makes me really look forward to training. Um, but if you really, really have to push it, um, obedience is um, by far the, the most important. Again, it's because it's the interaction. Like if you have, if you have the right obedience with a dog, that means that you you have good communication and you can teach him anything else that possibly genetically that dog is capable of. And if your obedience sucks, then you're, you can do other things, but you're going to 100% rely on, on the dog's raw genetics because you suck in interacting and teaching. And obedience, I guess it's the, you know, it's the mother of, of everything when it comes to dog training. From Breezy Bear, how soon do you introduce consequences to a young dog learning the games? It's a good question. So that's, uh, um, and by the way, like, I mean, almost everything that we talk about right now, it's in, in the videos, uh, chase and catch and possession games. So anybody that wants to go a little bit deeper into it, that, that would be a, a, a next thing to do. Um, so consequences, penalties, punishment, whatever we want to say it, they, dogs don't really, 
need a certain age to learn that. Um, again, I don't want to get too crazy. Like this is something we talk when like in, at class at my school. Um, you know, there is pleasant and unpleasant when it comes down to the, the most fundamental principle on, on earth. It's like you avoid something unpleasant, you approach something pleasant. And again, we are programmed. This is like a, like if we don't have that, we, it doesn't, life, you don't exist. Um, and, and so what happens, you know, even, even puppies that cannot walk, they, they are already responding as much as they can in this way. The, probably the very first time that they start to kind of be a little bit more uh, uh, self-conscious and, and actually able to do something about it, able to avoid something unpleasant, is in the litter box with mom. You know, if mom says you, you're done eating and you're just three weeks and you're barely stumbling and she tells you, no, don't, done. And you learn how to go away. So, so consequences is not something that it's a, you know, human construct. It's not, we, we don't need to teach them just like nobody needs to teach you if you, I mean, yes, I can tell you, don't put your hand on the hot stove, but ultimately you will not pay, not listen to me. And you ultimately you will eventually touch it. And hopefully it wasn't that hot and, and you learned the lesson. Um, so bottom line, there is no certain age where consequences are. It's not like uh, they, they are biologically ready to understand consequences. If you make sense, if it's all contingent, if, you know, it it's, could be a different story. If, for example, I walk into my training building and I decide to sit on a chair and I get electric shock. I reach for my glass and... I get electric shock, but then I reach again, but this time I don't. Then I touch this and just randomly, I experience bad stuff that doesn't make sense. Then I would not want to come in that room anymore. And whomever else is in that room that I may think that has something to do with it, of course, I will dislike them. But if it's only the glass or if it's something that makes sense, then, then that's, that's normal. That's how it should be. You know, that's kind of how, you know, uh, electricians that work on those high voltage poles, you know, they don't go to work shitless like I'm going to die today. They, they know what they need to do to stay safe and make big money. And, and it's, there is no, there is no, uh, it's not an age is not a factor. Um, Punishment is a very interesting topic, but it's not obviously, you know, it's a much, much deeper topic. But in short, um, it's a, any, any time really, okay. as long as you make sense. And as long as you, you know, um, there, is, there is a big difference between experience, brief pain, brief unpleasantness or suffering. And if, you know, like, like once you start thinking this way, you start to, you know, you, you have to make sure that you respect the animal and, and you don't do stupid things just because somebody else does it. Um, but for a normal, healthy person, we are prepared to think correctly for those kind of things. There is, of course, a lot of clutter that, you know, we watch all the time and, and including all the social sciences, you know. Um, I had this really cool podcast, I think it was a couple of months ago with um, these two brilliant people um, and, and they, they, they talked quite a bit about this. It's just kind of how genetically what what we do and what we don't and and how what how to respect 
what the dog offers and what it comes with, you know, so. Yeah. That. Um, earlier, we talked a little bit about um, how you how as humans, we can project our energy onto our dogs. Um, when you are going to a, a play session and say you're not in that that mood, is there any secret sauce that the Ivan secret sauce that you have to turn on the magic of play to get in the mood to uh, have a great session? Very good question. Yeah, that's uh... This is, that kind of depends how good of an actor you are. You know, that's why some people win the Oscars and some don't. And if you don't think you can win an Oscar, then if you don't, if you're not in the right mood, don't do it. But just step out, leave it alone. Leave it alone, go do something else, jump around, sing, bounce, recover, get to a, you, you, it's a really big deal. You have to have good energy. You have to feel, you know, it's almost like a cliche, but it's not cliche. If I really talk to you deep about it, you understand that this is so, so, so deep. Um, you, you don't mess around with that. Going back to my dog with the tracking, I think that was part of um, the, the big puzzle. Um, he he didn't really he just like any dog he keys and he's very connected and he knows if how if i am in a good place or or not in my head and of course when he's with me he's like well maybe maybe it's my fault for something and i'm stressing because look at you and so yeah if you if you're not capable to act and win an Oscar, then just leave it alone. That was, um, again, with one of my friends at the competition, because I, you know, as I said, I stayed like four weeks there up north and, and was hanging out with some of my friends there in New Jersey. And he was so good at it, like so good at it. Like there was a time where we will set up we will go to like a little stadium and make the whole setup and everything. But there was some reason, and I can't remember, but he was not in the right mood. And it was like, I, I'm not going to do it. And then I'm like, man, I, I need to pay more attention. I need to be more careful like this. Instead of trying to, it's not even worth putting up, you know, the, the, being the best actor like if you if you can go away and recover and feeling good it's so so important like i cannot like i literally can talk to you about a week on on how emotions and feelings and affect and 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 stuff like that works how how the brain perceives things because it's a even even if I get some stomach upset, where I, I ate something wrong, and and I don't feel good, when I don't feel good, my face, my body, everything, just my brain starts to work to try to manage that. But then I'm looking at you and I'm talking to you, and we have to get excited to do something. And you're looking at me and you're like, no, you're dude, you're not excited about it. But it's not that I'm not excited about it. I just don't feel good. And of course. It all leads to the next thing and the next thing. And, and this is like dogs can be so much more forgiving when you're in your happy place, so to speak, and you want to do. It's like, hey, let's go. Let's have fun. That, that's, that's when training is beautiful. And that's when it's enjoyable anyway. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, on, on that note, I, I would like to, to end this, but um, can you, I know there's a lot of people asking about, um, I don't know how much time you have, but I know you have so many videos on like teaching the out and um, like your podcast. What do you recommend people go and watch and to okay. find? Um, man, so like I am super selective on my podcasts who I invite to talk to. There was two that I kind of got stuck, and I'm sure most of you have listened 
to those two, unfortunately, because they have so many hits and it's about electric color and, and low level conditioning and stuff, which just ended up being a pointless discussions. But if anybody that's interesting and, and everything that I'm talking about is of interest, I strongly would suggest to listen to really all of the other podcasts that I have. Um, as far as videos on play, it's the for sure the chasing catch, the possession game, and teaching the out. The out is important because um, you cannot, you know, like when, when I want something and you want something and we were trying to play, but we end up in a fight how to separate from that, um, things don't go well. So these are the probably the three video, like the cornerstone, if you want to call it that way, of, of my training. Chase and catch, possession games, and the out. And there is no, really no particular order of anything. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, they have been, I, I got them in January, and it's been a game changer for Rika. Cool. So. How, old, how old is she now? Rika is now a year and three months. Okay. Yeah. And growing, growing fast. Growing fast. Yeah. Her body's filling out and it's, yeah, she's like, she's doing good. So, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Ivan, thank you so yeah. much. Always a pleasure. And uh, yes. I, look, I, I want, I'll go ahead and uh, listen to your podcast. You will love him. I guarantee you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for having me. Have Bye, a good everybody. night. See you. Yeah.